I want to invite you to open your Bibles or your Bible app to the book of Ephesians. We're midway through chapter 1, and um, A.W. Tozer says, uh, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What you believe when you, you think about the Lord matters greatly in your life. And so we have been seeing that our salvation and the way that the Lord is forming a body into one body, the way that God the Father is uniting everything in heaven and on earth together in Christ uh, is God's doing. And so we ask this question as we move into a a pivotal um, prayer uh, Paul has two great prayers in Coloss- or, I'm sorry, in Ephesians, although they mirror almost uh, identically, very similarly into the two prayers that are in Colossians as well. And so what Paul does is he moves into this from this, um, this doxology into a prayer of thanksgiving, which he doesn't do in every letter, uh, but he does in these cases here. And, um, and so it's a, it's a really incredible prayer. But you might ask this question, you know, if God uh, is in charge of everything... If God foreordains everything that happens before any of our days come to be, well, then what's the point in praying? In fact, why do anything? I mean, well, why, why pray? Why read my Bible? Why share the gospel? Why, why love our neighbor? Why turn our cheek when someone wrongs us? Like, why even do any of that? Well, the answer is God has also ordained means that he uses for us to grow in Christ-likeness. The Lord has chosen not to just snap His fingers or think that it should happen, and it happens. He has, in a, in a, in a way of understanding God's power at work in history, He has given us ways that He means for us to grow through in order to grow up into the likeness of Christ. And so we need to apply these means. We need to put these things into practice. It would be the difference in, say, uh, we, 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 we are positioned, for those who are trusting in Christ, we are, we are positioned as justified saints. Our position in Christ means that we stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. Sanctified, holy, we are justified Christians. If the Lord were to take us home right now, wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, if you're trusting in Christ, you would stand before the Lord and, and you know, if the Lord were to say, why should I let you into heaven? We wouldn't say, well, it's because I did this, it's because I did this, because I did this. If there was any because, it would just be because of Jesus. Because I'm, in, I'm trusting in Christ alone for my salvation. I don't bring anything to the table. It's not because Christ saved me and I read my Bible a lot. It's not because God saved me. I put my my faith in Christ and I shared the gospel with uh, 42 people or two people. It's not because of Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing. That is our position in Christ. Christ. And yet we're called to to practice our position. We're called to practice our position. Wouldn't it be odd if someone had just gotten married and they were excited about being married and then the next day or the next week or the next month, they just started running, running out on their spouse again? I mean, it just wouldn't make sense to us. Why? Because you're married. Practice your position. You're married. Walk as God has called you to live as one who is married to another person. And so that's how God calls us to do. He says to practice our uh, position through the means that God gives us. And so what we're going to see today is that uh, with the Apostle Paul, we pray, we are to pray that God would help his people know him more fully. We pray that God would help His people know Him more fully. And we'll get this up on the screen here for you. And you'll see two points this morning. One is that as we thank God for faith that allows us to thrive in this world, we pray for growth in wisdom for one another. 
As we thank God for th- faith that allows us to thrive in this world, we pray for growth in wisdom for one another. So let's read together and then we'll pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you for who you are. We praise you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We praise you that you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of you who have called us. And so, Lord, this morning, we, we lay ourselves before you and we ask that you would fill us with knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray that you would help us walk in a manner worthy of, worthy of the calling to which we've been called by our adoptive Father who's loved us and gave your Son for us, loving us beyond measure. Father, it's amazing that, that as humble sinners or proud sinners, we are able to please you. What a gift that is. And we pray, Lord, that you would help that become woven into the fabric of who we are as our life's greatest desire, that we would strive to please you. Not for your approval, not to earn your love, simply because you've saved us and you have set a path for us to walk in and we're to walk in it joyfully. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's read together. I got a little bit out of order there, so but they, Ephesians 1, 15. Uh, and you know, similarly to the last few weeks, this is another long sentence in the original language, so we're going to cover it in two weeks, but we're going to read the whole section uh, both weeks. So Ephesians 1, 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith, in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints. Give you a spirit, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called, What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and all power and all dominion, And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in us as we strive to understand it more deeply this morning. We're to thank God for the faith that allows us to thrive in this world. Verse, verse 16 talks about where Paul says that I, I, don't, I don't cease giving praise for you. I don't cease giving thanks for you. Let me rephrase that. Thanking the Lord for his work in you. It doesn't mean that Paul is always walking around, always praying every moment of every day. What he's saying is every time I pray, I am thanking God for you. And I just want to ask you to pause for a minute. Who are you thankful for? Who are you thankful for in the body of Christ? This is similar to, to what he prays in Colossians 1, 3 through 5. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, because the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. And so Paul is saying, for this reason, I pray for you. For this reason, what reason? For all of the reasons I just previously mentioned in verses 3 through 14. And, right, this this, uh, doxological praise, this this shouting out, building upon building of attribute of God after attribute of God, everything that God has done for us for this reason. And what else? Well, for, for the faith that I see that you have and your love 
for all the saints. He doesn't say your love for, for some of the saints. He says your love for, for all the saints. So we're thanking the Lord Jesus because of the faith that they have. Because I've heard of your faith. Paul's not with them. He's writing a letter. So obviously their faith is expressed in such a way that it's echoing, it's, it's resounding, it's reverberating to the point that Paul is hearing about their faith. It's a saving faith. It's a saving faith that's a gift from God that we are to be overwhelmingly thankful for. Wouldn't it be odd if you were to give your children a gift, a, 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 a magnanimous gift, whatever that might be? It's going to be in all kinds of different categories. That it's not attached to a dollar amount. It's not attached to a particular physical gift. But the value of that gift to the child or to the grandchild will differ depending on the family, depending on their hobbies, depending on what they like. And wouldn't it be odd if, if you gave that child that gift and there was just no expression of thanks? Now, it's not like we're looking to be pat on the back all the time, but it would tell us uh, maybe we need to help them learn how to be a little bit more appreciative in life, <laughs> right? I mean, as parents, right? I, mean, I had a friend one time that said, you know, we don't do, um, oh, I didn't plan this. So I have to think of how to say this carefully now. Um, I had to pick something else. Or I'm going to have parents mad at me, so I have to choose something else. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Paul is, I'm just going to move on. Paul is just brimming with, with gratitude. I just had an illustration that came to mind that uh, sometimes if you don't plan them out, yeah, they don't work out. So uh, for a variety of reasons. So thanks for your kindness. Paul is just overflowing with thankfulness. He's overflowing. We did this, did this thing at the house one time and we were talking just a little experiment. We had a bottle of water and we put, uh, you know, one paper clip in and then another and then another. And we just asked the kids in a, into, a, uh, into a glass. We said, how many paper clips do you think this will hold? You know, and, uh, you know, and, and there's a scientific reality that, that the water kind of holds itself together. So it'll actually go over top of the cup. It won't just be flat. It'll be like a bu bubble on top of the cup, uh, on top of the glass. And, you know, you think, oh, probably... At first, it's like five, then 10, and then, you know, well, you could put like 120 paper clips in before it actually begins to spill over, right? Uh, but this isn't just this, this, this drop by drop, the water's barely making it above the glass, so we're going to call that praise. No, this is just, this is pouring buckets of water into this glass that our lives hold, and we are brimming over, overflowing with gratitude for the salvation that we have in the Lord. If we are not, friends, we are not perceiving ourselves or the gift of God's grace that He has given us in Christ correctly. We're missing something big. If we're constantly walking around looking for God to, to give us more, to satisfy us here on earth. Now, I said at the beginning of our message, we are always looking to God saying, Lord, give me more, give me more, give me more of you. We're not talking about stuff. We're not talking about materialism. We're not talking about money. We're not talking about uh, making every relationship in our life uh, a work to our benefit. We're saying, Lord, I've got this difficult relationship in my life, and I need more of you to walk after you in a way that's worshipful and honoring. So give me more of you. And we want to be uh, constantly going after the Lord, asking him to fill us. And that's Paul's prayer. He's brimming over with gratitude for their salvation. Now listen, one of the reasons this is important and it connects to our society is in Ephesus, there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of resistance to Christianity. There was not a lot of resistance to religion. There was a lot of resistance to Christianity. In Acts chapter 19, Dr. Luke recounts this cultural clash that happens. And essentially what happens is Paul's sharing the gospel, more and more people are coming to the faith, and well, what starts to happen? Well, you have one silversmith, one worker of metal who says, now this guy's going around, he gets his buddies together, he says, now this guy's going around and he's telling them that the God of this world is not made by hands. Guys, that's a problem for us, because we sell these things made by hands. He's infringing on our commerce. He's cramping our style. He's going to cut into our profit margin. 
And this is not good. So what does he do? Well, he stirs up the crowds. They get more people there. And as you read more of Acts 19, it's like 21 to 41 in Acts chapter 19. As you read more of this, what you find is, I think it's in verse 31, 32, where uh, Luke tells us that the, the, that the, the city is stirred up into confusion here. And he's saying, well, he's preaching this God of Jesus Christ. Not the God that, that, that we celebrate in our temple here. He's preaching the God of Jesus Christ. He's, he's hampering our economy. And so he gets the crowd all stirred up into confusion. And there's a lot, this is classic like crowd theory here, right? Everybody's out in the streets. Everybody's nervous. Everybody's upset. I'm upset. Why? I don't know. They're, they're upset. So I, I, I must be upset. That's what's going on. He, he, even Luke says, they don't even really know why they're upset. They're confused. And so it's chaotic. And it's chaotic enough, in fact, that the disciples pull the apostle Paul back. And they prevent him from going out there because they, they love him and they, and they want to protect him. And so amid all of this hostility to the Christian faith, Paul says, I am so thankful for you. I am so thankful to the Lord the Father of glory, that He has given you faith. Because their saving faith was not simply intellectual affirmation of Christian belief about Jesus. But it was a saving faith that, as Scripture tells us we're supposed to, worked itself out. It's a saving faith that, that flowing from our ultimate union in Christ, the intimate fellowship we have with God the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who provided them with grace, grace and strength to survive, and not only survive, but to thrive in the world. Brothers and sisters, Paul is, Paul is saying, I'm so thankful to you because I'm thankful to the Lord for you, because it's God who's working in you. It's God who's accomplishing something in your faith, and you're following Him well. Keep on following Him well. And so this, this saving faith works itself out into a practical faith in the way that they have love toward one another. And that's what we see in the second half of 15, right? He says, uh, for this reason, because I have heard of your saving faith, in parentheses you might put, in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and then he goes on to his prayer. If you think about the love that God has called us to have toward all the saints, brothers and sisters, that ought to be our first clue that we need to walk in the Spirit. Paul says it in Galatians 5, walk in the Spirit so that you don't gratify the desires of your flesh, for the desires of the flesh are contrary to the Spirit. If we're, if you're gonna, if we're gonna walk in the flesh, you ought not expect that you're gonna be loving all the saints. Only when you walk in the Spirit, which continually puts us on, in utter dependence upon the Lord. When we think about it from our own uh, self uh, perspective, we think about how things affect us. I mean, that's natural. It's supernatural for us to think about how our actions affect others, how our words affect others, how our demeanor affects others. And so we need to be dependent on the Spirit. We need to be going to the Lord continually saying, Lord, I need you. I need you to fill me. I need you to move me. I need you to give me love that I don't feel for this brother or sister right now. Because it's not about how they benefit me. It's not about how they frustrate me. It's about how I surrender my life to the Spirit of God so that I might live in a way which doesn't show wonderful self-control to Matt McGee, but shows a supernatural overflowing of the Spirit of God in Matt McGee. That is the work of God, which Christ paid for on our behalf at Calvary. And so Paul sees this, and he is so thankful to the Lord for it. But here's what I want you to notice. He is telling them also. 
So we, we would be wrong to say, well, we, we should thank the Lord, but not thank other people. Well, not according to the Apostle Paul. Paul says to them, I'm thankful to the Lord for you. That's another way of saying, I praise God for you, brother, and the work that I see God doing in your life. I praise God for you, sister, in the way that, that, that you are able to use encouraging words to build up others. I'm thankful to you, older saints in Oak Grove Church, for the way you have paved a path of strict adherence to the Word of God for year after year after year after year. And we sit in this room, one room in a smaller section of the world, this big, massive world, as a people of God committed to the timeless, unchangeable truth of God's Word. And I'm thankful, we're thankful for God's work through you so that future generations would continue to hear the truth of the word. I was driving recently with some friends in North Liberty. And if you're down there, you'll see, uh, you know, different, obviously different kinds of things. But one of, the, one of the saddest things for me is to see old churches turned into smaller businesses. Now, it might not be for a wrong reason, I mean, all, all kinds of reasons, right, as, as cities develop and things move out, and, and so I understand that. It might be a healthy church that moves somewhere else and, and, uh, and is still thriving and healthy, but to see an older church turned into a small business is always something that's a little grieving to me. I would love to see a, an ongoing effect of churches that, that are growing, maybe planting other churches, but are constantly holding up the word of truth so that no business could ever find profit there. We don't want to be closing down churches because we can't get along. We don't want to close down churches because of any reason. We want to keep standing in our pulpits, holding forth the word of truth. Saints is, the word, is a word he uses here. Thanking the Lord for all the saints. All of those who are in Christ are saints. You are holy before the Lord. Their faith wasn't like a man who was attempting to cross this, I mean, this massive, uh, in Quebec, there's a river called the St. Lawrence River in Canada, and uh, Quebec, Canada, and, uh, and it's a pretty big river. And so this river freezes over, right, like most rivers do, and there's a man who went to cross this river, and um, not being sure of how to handle himself on ice too much, he gets down uh, on, on a knee, and he kind of, you know, tests the river. I mean, he know he can walk out the first five, eight feet, you know, it's, it's nice and that white that lets you know that the, the ice is really thick, you know, and, and then he gets down and he kind of does like this. He puts one hand out and kind of leans his weight forward. And then he slides a little bit further forward and, and puts another hand out. And then he's got, now he's got his full weight on there and he's starting to walk, but he's, he's doing it. He's wanting to test it, kind of banging the ice in front of him and, and testing it to see how the ice does. And he's about halfway out on this river. So if something happens now, I mean, you're, it's pick, pick your distance at this point, pick your direction at this point. And he hears this thundering sound behind him and behind him comes this this horse carriage, this, this, this heavy thing coming behind him, and it's just flying off of this road right onto the river. And he is petrified because he is testing the waters, making sure, or testing the ice, I guess, maybe a better way of saying it, uh, making sure that he can get across this river safely. And this horse carriage comes flying out onto the, onto the ice and just keeps going right past him. I wonder how many Christians walk this life of faith where we sort of are just, we're just tenuous. I don't know if God's faithfulness that saved me, the power that God had to raise Jesus from the dead. Okay, it seems to be okay. Are we just taking another step forward? Is this really going to work if I order my finances according to the way that God says I ought to order my finances? Or, you know, what's going to happen in this situation? If this, I've got this seething anger toward this person that legitimately hurt me. I mean, I've got a real wound here from someone that hurt me. And I just don't know if the forgiveness ability that God has given me by what he says he has done in Christ on my behalf is actually going to hold. Am I going to make it through that conversation well? Or, or, or do I need to just pour out a little bit of my vengeance toward that person so they really know how I felt? Oh, there we are. We're feeling the ice. We're seeing if God's ways really work. 
When we love the saints, what we do is we say, come on, let's go headlong. Let's not tiptoe across the ice. Let's, let's run toward the shore of eternity. Why? Because God's grace is solid. It's sturdy. It will not crack. God will not let you down. You will not find yourself slipping on the ice or standing on ice that begins to crack. You will stand on firm ground. You will stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. How do you know this? We'll get into that more next week. But real quickly, it's the same thing that we look at when we look at Romans chapter 6. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead to new life is the same power that will sustain you. Well, how does this happen? You say, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time and I still have these doubts. Well, it happens by practicing your position. You see, God has given us means by which we are to walk in order to see our faith grow. If I were to tell you that I wanted to enter a bodybuilding competition in the near future, once you finished doubling over with laughter, right, you, you would start to give me sort of a, 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 sort of a regimen, right? You'd start to say, well, here's what you need to do first, right? And I would start maybe talking about what I think I need to know what I need to do. And you'd say, no, <laughs> you're not the expert in this, clearly. So, uh, so what do we do? Well, there's a certain way that this needs to happen. There are certain foods that you need to eat. There's a certain way that you need to work out, right? It's not just the same kind of cardio workout that you're going to try to do to stay healthy, right? So there's a certain way you're going to go about this. God says, if you're going to mature as believers, and that is my will for you, right? So let's not be clear. I mean, let's be, <laughs> maybe that too, I don't know. If you're going to grow into mature and equipped followers of Christ, there are certain things that you must do. And this is what Paul begins to pray for here. He says he prays for growth in wisdom. We see it in 17 and 18. I continue to pray for you that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now, God will give this to us, but he doesn't just do a brain dump. What God has done is he's, he's worked to give us a closed canon of 66 books in the Bible to see how God has worked throughout salvation history to save a people unto himself, to equip them, and to win battles for them. But he calls us to walk through it. He calls us to, to open the word so that our minds are not conformed to this world, but are, are transformed. When Paul talks about knowledge like this, there, there's, a, there's a knowledge that comes from, or a wisdom that comes by knowing more information. And that's true, brothers and sisters. We need to know more information. But reading the Bible isn't a textbook. We, we read the Bible and we do learn more. But what happens is we grow in our intimacy with the Lord as we spend time in the Word. It's not about, oh, I got to check this off. No, it's about growing in fellowship with God as we read and we understand his word. You say, well, I don't understand it. Well, you're not gonna until you begin to pick it up, until you begin to read it. And then we must put it into practice. Otherwise, we're like a man who, who looked in the mirror, turned away, and immediately forgot who he was. Immediately forgot the power of God that is at work in our lives by the one who made the world by saying, let there be light. And the God who said, let there be light has shown it in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, which we learn about through his word. You want to know how to handle your finances? It's in the word. You want to know how to, how to, how to handle or stand up under temptation? It's in his word. Every temptation that you and I face, God holds us accountable for, but he has also given us everything that we need.
to stand up under it. And he's faithful. He's faithful to see us through. And so what happens is this wisdom uh, is knowledge that is applied. So for example, if I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, and I begin to think I need to handle it according to my own wisdom, I make my own choices, I do my own thing, I'm not actually testing God on His Word. I'm not actually growing in the faith. What I need to do is say, I need to put, put everything in my life under the stewardship and under the wisdom of the Lord. And as I handle my finances when it doesn't make sense to me that way, what I learn is it's not about math. It's about God. When I, when I move into a relationship, uh, realm of relationship that I'm not comfortable with, that I don't know how to do on my own, I move into it forgiving another for someone who has harmed me. And what I begin to discover is that God is actually sufficient. God is enough. God will enable me to forgive. And what I'll realize is that as I forgive others in Christ, it's the Lord who heals me, not a vengeance that's enacted or not even just a human relationship that's made cordial again. But it's the power of God at work in his people as we put it into practice. I know far too many Christians who say, you know, I, they feel a little, um, a little sort of like the, the, the carpet got, the, the, uh, I can't think of the phrase, the carpet got pulled out from under them, the rug got pulled out from, uh, from under them because they trusted in Christ, but they're not putting it into practice. They're not walking by the Spirit, and they wonder why either they're not growing or life is not making sense to them. Well, of course it's not. And so what Paul prays is that let's have, I, I, I want to pray for wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Father, Son, and in the Holy Spirit so that God would open our eyes to know three things. One, the hope that God has called us to. Remember, brothers and sisters, we walk by faith, not by sight. And you will not grow in your faith. I will not grow in my faith until we take steps of faith, which means what? It does not always make sense to us. It does not always seem like it will work to us until we step out in faith. And I will tell you something. There was a season in my life where I was discerning the Lord's direction. And do you know, I actually made a decision that ended up being the wrong decision in my life. It wasn't a sinful decision that I know of anyway. I guess we'll find out one day. But I, I thought I was going where the Lord wanted me to go. And in the process, the Lord taught me how to listen to Him in new and different ways. And then when I realized that the Lord directed my path, which Proverbs promises that, a man plans his step, steps, but the Lord directs his path. And when I realized it was actually the Lord that was calling me to go serve in a different area, see, my stepping out in faith and the Lord redirecting me did not harm me in any way. My faith grew, my relationship with the Lord grew. Because I thought I was going one place, I got rid of whatever stuff a college kid has, which is not much, but I was free to go serve the Lord wherever he called me to go. And I learned, I grew. The Lord will not ever let you down when you walk in faith. God has called us to an eternal hope, a glorious hope that is forever unfading in eternity. And when we fix our eyes on this world, we're forgetting the hope that we've been called to. Of course, we're discouraged. Of course, we're frustrated. Of course, we're confused with this Christianity when we're looking to this world. But we have the riches of the glorious inheritance that we are looking forward to. But not only then, it's a present reality in our lives now. You have inherited everything that is available to our Lord Jesus Christ when before his ministry began, he was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And every time he responded with the word of the Lord to his temptations. You have the same power within you, brother and sister, that every time that the Lord Jesus prayed of his three times that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Lord, not a father, not my will done, but yours be 
done. Lord, if there's any other way to get me out of this, I'll take it. And the Lord says, walk this way. Walk according to the Spirit. Everything that you need, I've given you. Stop crawling across the river, saint. Stand up. Stand firm. Walk in faith. Step by step. Why? Because we are held, we are undergirded by the immeasurable greatness of His power. Toward who? Toward us who believe. And I want to tell you something. This is a letter written to Christians, but we sell the gospel short. We sell the Lord short, and we actually lie to those we care about. If we sell them, or not sell them, if we tell them about any gospel other than you need to repent of your sins, turn away from yourself, and fully throw yourself on the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is God's greatness of his power toward us who believe. When you think about Romans 8, 28, it's the verse that, that we love and, 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 right, God causes all things to work together for the good of who? Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So does God work to the goodness of, of, of everyone in every situation? No, to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So what is that motive for us? To say, friend, trust Christ. I know that what you're going through is difficult, but if you will throw off the self, stop relying upon your own wisdom and understanding, and run to the one who has given his life for you, you will see God work in ways that you never would have imagined possible. And so we, we stand firm. And as we do so, we say, God, I'm so thankful for these brothers and sisters. And this is, in fact, the prayer that we're to pray for one another. You say, well, I don't know how to pray for the body of Christ. Now you do. And there's four of those just in, in, in Ephesians and, and Colossians. Open your Bible and, and pray. Pray the Psalms. Pray Scripture. Your, your prayers won't be dull, they won't be repetitive, and they will be laser-focused on the glory of God. Let's follow him. Let's see how he works in our life as a church family. And let's be always praying that God would add more to his kingdom and that we would be able to be a great part of it. Amen, church family? Let's pray. Father, we are thankful to you. Sometimes uh, we focus on things that are temporary and we... Um, we lose our focus. We, we begin to look at what's right in front of us, what we are able to see, what we are able to understand. And Lord, you have called us such, to such a great and glorious hope. You have given us power that is unimaginable. And it's real. You've given us a promise of a, a future hope. But the promises are our are, are future and present as we walk in faith. And we need one another to help us in this. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to be praying for one another, encouraging one another in you, because you're the one who does the work in our lives. Father, we pray that you be glorified as we eat this bread and drink this cup here, this meal that you've given for, for believers to partake in together, Lord. We, we see in the drama of redemption, Lord, that you are making us into one. We do this together as a reminder. Until the day that you come home, Lord, we keep remembering how you have redeemed us, how you have saved us by giving your own life. And certainly as your students, we're not greater than you. And so may we, may we follow your example as we carry our cross. We pray, Father, that it would all be done for the praise and honor of your name.